Thank you for joining us. We're in uh, the newest deck house. Um, we just finished manufacturing about two months ago. Um, you're all here today to learn about deck house pieces, parts. If you have any questions, um, raise your hand. I'll try to answer it the best of my ability. If I can't answer the question, I will ask you to email me and I'll point you in a direction with uh, someone who, who can. Uh, today we're gonna talk mostly about windows, doors, and sliders. Um, Deck House started in 1959. We started manufacturing own, our own windows and doors then. Sliders, we started manufacturing about 1981. So your, most of the windows in your homes look like this here on the interior. Uh, in 1959, the jam of your, the frame was inch and a quarter. So you can kind of tell the year your house was built by the jam and what you have for a thickness of glass. So we started, we manufactured the window frame, but the, the sash, a sash is the operable part of your window, is actually, or was actually steel, um, made by another company that was inserted on site. Uh, in 1977, we started manufacturing our own mahogany sash. And since then, we've broken down that window to put in place of the old steel. Does anyone have steel sash in their house? Anyone? All right. Um, I do recommend maybe thinking about changing them out eventually. Uh, it's gonna be much more efficient to have the mahogany sash. Maybe try the rooms you're in the most. Um, the old steel, there's no uh, thermal break. Uh, basically, if it's zero degrees outside, it is zero degrees on the inside of your, your window. If you touch your window, it's absolutely freezing. If it's freezing outside, you're wiping up um, condensation that's dripping on your mahogany and staining it, and uh, you'll actually see frost on the interior sometimes. Anybody ever see frost on the inside of the windows? All right, you guys gotta call me. All right, so, um, the glass on the windows, uh, we were very ahead of our time uh, in, at Deck House. We were doing insulated glass uh, way before a lot of other companies were. A lot of the guys that went to MIT uh, talked to the owners at our company and worked in uh, the insulated glass. Um, your window, as a cross section, looks like this. So your jam, what you see for interior trim, what looks to be interior trim, is actually part of your frame. That is your window frame. Easy way to find out the size of your window is to measure from the edge of your mahogany, what looks to be trim, to the opposite side. That is the exact size of your window. Same thing with the height, okay? If there's a problem with the sill, your sill is one piece. Call me up, we'll see what we can do to, to help resolve any issues there. So you have your glass that's inserted on your inside the, the window frame. Some of you may have single pane glass. That is a, about an R value of one. If it's a insulated unit from maybe the, the 70s, it probably has an R value of two if there's just air between them. You add argon, that's an R value of three. You add a uh, low E coating, R, R value of about four, and that's what we do today. We use 3 16 glass, a half inch bronze colored spacer. Bronze complements the mahogany, so it's gonna look better than a bright, flashy uh, aluminum colored spacer. Uh, and then the 3 16 glass with a, the low E coating, argon filled. If you have an older deck house from the 60s or 70s, you may want to go with a, a thinner piece of glass, maybe 5 eighths. Try to get as much out of it as possible, maybe 3 quarters, and you're going to get a lot more uh, energy efficient savings out of a thicker piece of glass in your window. Basically, you want to have someone come out, take out the stop bead, and insert an insulated piece of glass. To measure it, easy. On the outside, you want to measure where your frame and your stop bead meet. Measure to the opposite side. Subtract one quarter of an inch. You can see here, some of you will pass this around. There is one eighth of silicone between the glass and the frame. Okay? So that's why we're subtracting a quarter of an inch. And that's on the rectangle pieces. The trapezoids, call me up, we'll figure that out. But uh, changing out glass on a deck house window, maybe not something that everybody here can do, but a contractor can do that, shouldn't be a problem, okay? Here, I'll pass this around. So your sash may not open up that easily. Um, in 1977, we had uh, the first version of our deck house mahogany window. Um, it had a truth one-armed operator. 
Uh, you can tell it's a truth one-armed operator because it has one arm. But also because the, uh, hold on one second, the cover is actually steel. It, on the newer ones, on the two-armed operator, the cover is actually a piece of plastic. So you can quickly tell if you have a one-armed operator or a two-armed operator if it is plastic or steel, all right? If you need to replace one of these, uh, the instructions are on everybody's chair, but call me up, I'll give you some tips if needed. Um, the one-armed operator will require not only the replacement of the operator itself, it will require replacing the bottom piece, what we call a screen retainer stock, okay? Because it is completely different now, Truth stopped making that one Truth operator um, probably about three years ago. The most similar style is a little bit different. Instead of angles, it's all curved. So it doesn't fit the old notch that we cut out of the old uh, mahogany bottom screen, operate, uh, screen retainer cover. Um, basically, you wanna take off two pieces of mahogany on the side, what we call screen retainer side pieces. Take them off from the back. That way, if you scratch it, you'll never see it. It's on the opposite side where the window closes into. Take that off, take the bottom piece off, insert the new operator connected to your window, you're done. All right? Uh, any questions on operating windows in your deck houses? Yes? And it's probably, I, I kind of didn't see it in the list of how to do it, but how does that plastic piece come off? It pops right off. You put a putty knife under it? Or? Um, yep. If I had a screwdriver on me like I usually do, the, so there's a, usually a set screw in the uh, handle. Yeah. You remove the set screw. The newer ones have a spring-loaded like, uh, piece of metal, like almost like a, a snap. Pull it right off, and you can either with a uh, fine putty knife, maybe even your hand sometimes, pop that right off. Go underneath and just slowly work it. It should pop right off. Good question. Thank you. All right. Anything else on operable windows? Really, it's obviously not completely um, filled. The, the space in in the frame where that goes through, right? There's enough space there. So, what do you usually put in as the uh, insulator there? Insulated. I, I, I found I put some of those. I found all kinds of things. Yep. In my, in my place. So. Good point. The um, old deck houses uh, with the mahogany sash from 77 to, I'd say, probably the late 90s have a tan V-shaped piece of weather strip that's borderline useless. Um, it's a barrier. It's not a real good insulator. Um, there's a kerf on the edge of the window that the weather strip goes into. It has a little uh, nub with some fingers that locks it in there. Uh, the old plastic will dry out, crack, and fall out. And that's where things can get around your window and into your, the cavity where the operator is. The newer weather strip is a, you know what? Here, let me do this. Okay. So this is the newer weather strip on windows, what we've been manufacturing with for the last probably about 10 years. It has a round tube filled with a, comp with a uh, compressible foam. It fills up to almost a quarter of an inch from where the window sits to the frame, but compresses down to almost a sixteenth of an inch. So when your house settles and you have a square frame and your sash is square, but now your, your frame is starting to go a little bit out of square, you're going to have gaps, you're going to have tight spots. This is going to fill up that void. Um, when replacing uh, operators and things like that, I do recommend maybe trying to, to uh, change out weather strip. Uh, if you feel a draft, it is definitely something you want to do. Maybe get one window's worth. Try that out and see how that works for you. Has anyone done that here? Changed out? How did you, how did you like it? Did it work out for you? Yeah. So sometimes if the, if the window, if the house has settled quite a bit, and the window is rubbing in one area, you put on a beefier weather strip, it's gonna be even harder to open and close. What you wanna do is kinda scribe around the window, set like a compass at an eighth of an inch. Go around the frame with the metal part touching the frame, and if that pencil touches the window anywhere, shave that window, and then reinsert the weather strip. The window will probably open and close better than it ever has, and now it'll be sealed better than it ever was. Does that help? Yeah. All right, yes. But to follow up on that, in the space that's in the sash, yep. where all kinds of stuff wants to live, can you fill that up with foam? Um, I don't, okay, so the, the question is, 
where the operator sits, can you insulate that and fill that with foam so other things can't get in there? Bugs, insects, uh, pumpkin bugs, stink bugs. Um, I would say I, that's a very good question. I don't think so. Um, the gears of the window need to move, and I'd hate for anything to slowly break down and, and gunk that up and maybe even make it harder to, to open and close the window. I would say if you're able to change out the weather strip, it's it's it expands you know, almost a quarter of an inch. It should fill the whole void around the perimeter of the window and the sash. It should keep almost everything out of there. All right? And don't you need to put anything into the cavity itself? I, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think at some point, if something keeps breaking down because it's always moving and it gets into the, to the gears, then it might you know, cause more of a problem. OK? Yes, sir? That interior cavity, should that be finished? Any exposed wood should be finished, yes. So any moisture that might get in there. And a lot of people just think of exterior moisture, like rain. Uh, you also want to think about interior, showers. You boil water, your breath. Um, believe it or not, that creates moisture inside your house. So if you get a new window, a sash, a door, a slider, you want to seal all six sides as soon as humanly possible. We recommend doing it within seven days. Any, if you seal one side, say you seal the exterior, you, you protect it from the weather, but you're taking a shower, boiling water, and the inside can absorb water. The inside of that window is expanding and contracting while the outside is not. You will warp your door, window, or slider. It'd be better almost not to do it at all, but you do want to seal all six sides as soon as possible on any exposed wood on windows, doors, and sliders. And that means take a sash out. I've seen uh, houses that were 15 years old where uh, someone had a problem. They sent me pictures of the door. No one ever sealed where the doors overlapped in a slider and they were wondering why it was warping. That was the problem. It was able to absorb water for 15, 14 years or something like that. So you want to make sure that anything, any wood you have in your house that's exposed is sealed. All right, tops of doors, I've seen that as well. Um, if everything on the door is sealed except for the top or bottom and that can absorb moisture, your door will move one way or another, okay? All right. Any other questions on, how, yes? How hard it is to replace the old steel sash uh, windows with the newer mahogany ones? Okay. I'd say if you have any carpentry experience, you should be able to replace the sash yourself. Uh, finished carpentry, better than a, a framer. Um, so basically, to replace the old steel with a mahogany sash, you need to you know, get me the size. You want to know the handing of the unit. Basically, the handing of a, of a window is done from the outside. When you look, because it's drawn by an architect or a designer from the exterior, it's where the hinge point is. So if you're on the outside of a, uh, the house looking at the house, if the hinge is on the right, it's a right hand. If the hinge is on the left, it's a left hand. But most people talking to me and say, hey, Steve, I need an operator. You're on the inside of the house. I'm not going to say, OK, well, picture yourself the outside. It's where the lock is. On the inside, you tell me where the lock is, and that's the handing of the window. If the locking mechanism is on the left, it's a left hand. And it's all in the, the documentation that's, that's out there. Um, so what you want to do is, once you have all that, um, you're going to take off, uh, there are 3 8 strips on the exterior, a little stoppy that goes around the steel. You take that off. You carefully take the steel window out, hopefully first floor. Um, second floor, it's going to be a little heavy. You want to have a couple people there. Um, especially a double steel unit. Um, you're going to take that off and you're going to clean the wood where the um, uh, glazing compound was where the steel was. It's gonna, it could be like a hard rock substance or it could still be a, uh, uh, it might have some elasticity to it and might be a, a caulking that's still there. You want to clean that off thoroughly. Um, you're going to take hardware that we supply. You're going to take a track and mount it to the, to the sill and the other hinge track and mount it to the head jam. Uh, you're going to mount the uh, operator to your sill and you're going to marry the two. Half the hardware is already on the sash that we're supplying. You're going to marry the two, open and close the window. See how well it closes. You can adjust where the hinges sit so you can pivot the window if it's not closing exactly the way you want it if the house is settled. Um, you can also, like I said, shave the edge of the window if the house is really settled or if your, your uh, frame is swollen. Uh, once you have everything connected and it opens and closes the way you'd like, uh, you're now going to put on your screen retainer stock. You're going to start with the uh, top piece, uh, bottom piece, and then put on your side pieces and your locks. Um, you're going to seal it 
and you're done. It sounds a lot easier than it is. If, <laughs> yeah. Um, you, it's, if you're not good with finished carpentry, you probably want to call someone. Um, but it wouldn't hurt to probably have someone else there, especially handling the steel. It's glass, and especially if you're on the second floor. And what do you seal it with? Oh, that's a good question. There are so many options out there, and your house is how old? 1974. It's really difficult for us to say what to seal your house with. Colors, um, styles, uh, uh, if it's flat or if it's glossy, to match what you already have there. So basically, I can send you a list of what other people have done and a ton of information. But for me to tell you what to seal it with, I tell you the wrong color, now I'm the bad guy. So um, it's just doing some homework, seeing what works with, um, with mahogany, because not all stain, paints and stains work well with dense hardwoods like mahogany. Um, there's also a deck house owners Facebook group. It's 480 something people that it's just deck house owners. It's a private group. It has nothing to do with us as a company, but it's a bunch of you helping each other out. And with paint colors and things like that, that I'm not going to be as helpful. There's 480 people out there that will give you their suggestions of what they used, what works, and what doesn't, if that helps. OK? Anyone else? Oh, uh, are we moving on from windows? Um, I was thinking about it. <laughs> Sure, go right ahead. So I don't know if you covered this already, but uh, we, uh, this past winter, we've noticed a lot of uh, icing uh, from inside. Yep, OK. So how do you deal with that? Uh, are they steel windows or are they mahogany windows? Mahogany. OK. So that is cold air and warm air meeting. So it's either, uh, is it single pane glass or insulated glass? OK. If it's single pane, that's, the, that's probably the weakest point of your house when it comes to being um, efficient, like heat-wise. Um, it's either that or there's weather strip that's missing somewhere on that window. If it's an operable window, cold air is coming right in, meeting warm air, and it's going to condensate right there. Um, I'd say that's probably what's, what's going on. So then it's replacing? It's replacing weather strip. It's um, changing your, your single pane glass to an insulated unit and just kind of trying to figure out where that cold air is, is coming in. Because it's, it's only going to condensate when cold and warm meet. So it's, it's happening right there at the windows. Windows is the, is the weakest part of your house when it comes to you know, heating. Um, but it's even worse if there's, a, if there's um, air coming in. Uh, we also have 11 skylights that we replaced this last year. OK. The roof. Uh, and then after they did that, we still noticed some um, condensation again occurring on some of the skylights, the inside. OK. But then they went back and recalled. Is that the term? That OK, yep. Whatever they do outside. They so will something like that work for these regular windows too? Caulking really isn't going to do anything for, it, would, it may help temporarily with a leak, but condensation, again, is, is cold air and warm air meeting. It could be that when that skylight was framed, that there could be the tiniest gap of insulation that wasn't there. So the heat is going to go where? It's going to go up. So it's, if it escapes your skylight or goes into your roof system somewhere and meets cold air either on the skylight or in your sheathing, that's where you're going to see the drips and you're going to see the condensation uh, build up. Um, today's skylights are much more efficient than, than older skylights. If you're ever thinking about redoing your roof, automatically say change out your skylights. Even if it's four years old, you could have a skylight that has um, a, a glazing compound that's kind of stiffened and it's not it's lost its elasticity and someone's now you know prying out a skylight and setting it aside you get a hairline crack somewhere that wasn't there before and you're glazing they put it right back on it looks perfectly fine now you have a leak and now everybody's pointing fingers so if you ever redo your roof definitely definitely change out the skylights to something a little more uh, efficient okay so one more thing but, yes uh, that condensation and, and uh, frost that you'll find but yes if it's not the operable window, but rather the fixed one, so we have actually that happening in one of our windows. Okay. Looks like 
it's uh, just a broken seal or uh, the glazing tape? Yep. So, how you deal with that? Yep. So, if you have a seal failure, basically it's somewhere around the piece of glass where the glazing is compromised. So, air is actually getting in. When air goes in, it brings moisture in. Moisture brings minerals. So, that's why it looks like it has a white, white look to it. It's minerals that are stuck to your glass from the glass from the water evaporating. Okay, so if, if air is getting in there, you need to change out that, that piece of glass. I mean, it's not uh, essential, but if you want a nicer looking piece of glass, if you want the condensation to not be there, you definitely want to change out that glass. It could also be that on the, do we have that sample, the glass, the wooden, I'm gonna grab that real quick. Thank you, sir. All right, so, your stop bead, like I said, there is, there is a whole, like when we do the windows, we use a uh, pneumatic gun to force silicone in there. There's no gaps anywhere. If any of the windows have been resealed and someone doesn't, doesn't put enough silicone in there, there's an air bubble, air bubble um, then you could have water, air and water getting in. To that, to that area around the, the stop bead, all right? So maybe take off the stop bead, make sure there is silicone around there. If there's not, clean it up a little bit, inject silicone, put the stop bead back on, and that might resolve the, the problem. Yeah, okay? All right. Okay. So we have probably a couple places we have that stop bead actually cracked and ah. kind of warping. Uh, yep. Oh, you yeah. definitely want, you want to change that out. Um, basically, if you have stop bead pulling away from the window, Water's getting in there. Water is one of the elements that'll create a seal failure. It'll break down the glazing of the window. There are two things that do that. I don't know if I already said it or not. Sun, UV rays, and water. So if you have your stop bead pulling away from your glass, water can get in there and that'll cause a seal failure. So it's not just an aesthetic look of, of stop bead, you know, not looking great. It's actually causing seal failures around the house, okay? Yes, sir. It's something I found refinishing a bunch of removable mahogany sash. I was spending a lot of time very carefully sanding and stripping around the stop bead. I'd use a heat gun. If you get a heat gun anywhere near that glass, you're going to be buying new glass. It cracks immediately. Gotcha. Hmm. It's a lot less trouble just to buy a new stop bead. Knock out the old stuff instead of sanding it. Yep. Then you've got a flat weight on the sand and then cut and replace the stop bead. Looks better, and it's by the time you're done, a lot less work. Good point. Yes. All right. So, some people would, you know, have a hard time color matching old to new, and they'll want to keep old stop bead. Um, but yes, you maybe take it off and sand it down and put it back. But you're absolutely right. If it's on there and you're trying to clean it up, um, heat, UV rays uh, will break glass. Um, we had a customer buy a couple new window units and put them in a room, just set them there, and, and put them right on a heat register. Within a day, one piece was cracked and one wasn't. And we're trying to figure it out. And he re realized I put it right on the heat register. So glass, if some part of it is heating up, it's expanding and contracting at a different rate than other parts of that glass, and it'll break. Um, I've also heard of people will say, hey, how come my uh, slider shattered? No one was around. Um, I've heard stories of uh, tempered glass, someone hitting it, and then when the next drastic temperature change happened, it shattered. There was a customer that wasn't happy because their slider glass kept shattering. And we actually asked them to videotape. And they had a cleaning person with a stand-up vacuum going around the table and would hit the slider. And, every, and this happened like four times, and they, would, they weren't happy at all. But then we showed them it was, it was someone in-house breaking the glass. It didn't happen right then. But when there was a, a drastic temperature change overnight, boom, it shattered. No one was around. So they were blaming us for using uh, imperfect glass or, or something like that. So just keep that in mind. Uh, slamming the door most likely won't happen, but you definitely don't want to, you don't want to slam the slider door either. All right? Yes, sir? Somewhat related to that because, <clears throat> so as we make these houses tighter and tighter, there's really no heat exchange or no air exchange. And part of the condensation on the inside of the windows is the 
No, you got a lot of moisture on top. So the, the question is that houses are getting tighter and tighter and want to find a way to get air into the house. Um, I, am, I do not do HVAC, but I know that there are systems that have air exchangers within the, the heating systems. Um, the exterior fans uh, for bathrooms and things like that. Um, that I'm going to have to look into and, and get back to you, but I believe a lot of heating systems now, they're asking for a direct uh, air exchange within the system. Yes, um, Jason. Um, I spoke with Wilson Brothers, who's a local HVAC, and they've done some work in deck houses, and one of the things they told me was that the, mini, the new mini split systems, if you put in uh, like the mid species units, the heat and cooling ones, they actually have a humidity detector, and what it does is it'll actually help reduce humidity in the room. Okay. It's heating and cooling, so that might help some of the moisture, especially on the uh, low rates. Okay, that's a good point. So one other thing is that uh, Jason brought up that uh, mini splits uh, might help control moisture and humidity within the houses, but also if you're looking for AC, you can't get there from here in, in an older deck house. Newer deck houses are made a little bit differently, but the older ones where you have your three by six tongue roof flooring between levels and beams as joists eight feet on center, there's no cavity there. So a lot of builders and homeowners will recommend a mini split uh, maybe several to uh, cool your home uh, if that's what you want to want to do. Um, I went to a uh, home inspectors. Uh, I spoke at a home in home inspectors meeting, let's say, and the person that spoke before me was um, speaking about what he's found in heating systems and ductworks and things like that. It's nasty. Um, one thing he says that a lot of people feel comfortable with mini splits and don't clean them. You definitely want to make sure you you set up a service where they clean it periodically, or you clean it. Um, heating systems, uh, especially like forced hot air or something, that is feeding your house with with heat, but it's also carrying around dust, dirt, and, and things like that. So you definitely want to make sure you maintain your heating systems and cooling systems as needed. Okay? Thank you. All right. We ready to move on to sliders? Yes, Steve. Yes, sir. All right. Here we go. All right. Sliders. Okay. So in, again, 1959, we were using, uh, sorry, 19, yeah, 1959, we were using aluminum sliders. Uh, there's been several different companies we're using. Um, there have been Arcadia that have a screen on the interior, and it's like a metal color, all right, aluminum color. There was um, New Englander that probably most people have. It, um, it's an aluminum slider, either tan or um, might be brown, like a bronze. It has a black handle and a mahogany grip to that. So if you have that, that is a New Englander slider. Uh, that we have wheels, uh, stainless steel track covers on that, and just the handle grip itself. That's it. New England went out of business probably mid-80s or, or something like that. Um, we had a few capital and other slider companies, but at one point we kind of got fed up with, with how uh, inefficient they were, and, and uh, we made our own. So in about 1981, we started the, the um, mahogany sliding glass door, and it's changed so much, probably almost every other year with, with improving it uh, since then. In 19, about 81, it started. In 1991, we completely changed the style of how it was built. Um, so if you have a slider from um, 81 to 91, parts are a little bit tough. If you need something, call me. Um, we can help you out with weather strip, uh, sill extensions, that's one thing that goes. So your slider sill is shaped like this. I don't know if everybody can see that. Um, but your sill is solid, just like your windows inside and out. On top of the slider sill ugh, is your track, okay? It's aluminum. So if you have a heavy slider that's been on there for 30, 40 years, it's going to start to mushroom or, or something like that. So we offer a stainless steel track cover. It's 17 bucks. It's a U-shaped piece of stainless steel that goes right onto the track that we use today on every slider that'll help the wheels move easier than maybe on your existing slider now. And that, sorry, that stainless steel track cover can be used on almost any slider we've ever done. So if you do have a slider that's tough to open and close, you gotta put your foot up against the wall and really pull, then you might wanna try to get a stainless steel track cover. Uh, wheels, we do have wheels for the New Englander slider. Um, 
and we can do that in the stainless steel track cover. The wheels for the first version of the sliding glass door, you'll have adjustments to raise and lower one side or the other on the sides. You won't have a, brown, a bronze plastic plug like, like these do. Um, that, to replace the wheels, call a carpenter. Don't do it yourself. It requires taking the door off the, off the track and routing out and adding wood underneath because the wheel is completely different. The adjustment on the end is a long screw and then you have your wheel set. Anything there breaks, we don't have that, that wheel anymore. It's, it's not very efficient. Um, the newer ones have a, oh, I got those right here, hold on. All right, the newer wheels look like this. It is a, closed ball bearing wheel so that dirt, dust, and animal hair does not get into the wheel and slow it, slow it down over time. This thing's gonna roll as good as it did on day one for many, 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 many years, okay? This has an adjustment on the face, as you can see right there. It's a little bronze plug you take off, you take a regular head screwdriver, and you're able to raise and lower one side or the other or both of that slider. If it's not locking properly, open it an eighth of an inch so that you can see reveal top to bottom. If you see a larger gap at the top or the bottom, you need to adjust that so it's, it's even and maybe that's why it's not locking properly, okay? Uh, let's see, wheels. So then we started in 1991 when we redesigned the slider itself it was a wet glaze gasket to a dry glaze gasket. It's, it's more efficient, it's neater. Um, we completely changed the handle. We use a, a Hopi, I think it's Hoppy uh, handle set now. It is a multiple point lock. It is the sturdiest handle I've ever seen. If anyone has any of the older sliders from like 1981 to, ni 1981 to 91, I don't know how many times you replaced your handle, it's probably been many times. It's just a, it's a, a white metal, it's fairly cheap, but that's what was uh, available back then. This thing, I think you could drive a tank over it and you're still gonna be able to open the door. Um, it has a secondary locking point near the top. That's another way to, to identify uh, if, how old the slider is. If it has a secondary flush bolt at the top, that is a newer slider. It's at least 1991. Um, it's also great because you can open up your slider four inches, lock it, and no one's getting in, but you're allowing air into the house. That slider also uses a, uh, the Solar Band 60 glass. It has a U value of 0.25. It's a very, very good glass. All right. Um, if anyone's looking to change out a slider, a lot of times at the older houses, there were banks of sliders across the back of the house. Anyone have that? Yeah, it's like three, four. Sometimes I've even seen five. You can change them out to all sliders or you can put window combinations in their place. They, the framework looks identical on a window to a slider. So it's not gonna look like you did something different after the fact, it's gonna look just the same as the slider in a deck house, okay? Um, a window combination is generally less expensive than a slider as well. So if you don't wanna push a couch against a slider because you have five in a row, at some point when you're looking, for, looking to do it, give me a call, we'll see if a window combination will work in its place, okay? All right. How, you, how would you replace a, a bank of sliding doors with a window combination? You have to build up the wall? Nope, not at all. We manufacture windows the same size as a slider. A slider is about 51 and a half square feet. Basically we can do, there's about 15 different window combinations and it might even be in the packet that you have. There might be several different window combinations the same size as a slider. We do it all the time. That's, that's not a problem. And if you wanted to build up a little knee wall and then put a shorter window for more electrical or something like that, that's no problem either. Uh, fixed glass can be made into just about any, any size. As long as a glass company can make a, make a piece of glass, we can make a window around it, okay? We've made windows and sliders that were 12 feet by 14 feet, and I don't think we've done much bigger, but all the way down to like one foot by one foot. So basically, it can fill any area. The only thing you're limited to is um, most of the time if, if it was an operable unit. If you want to stay with a, a standard size, you're limited to, to heights um, and sometimes widths. Uh, but as long as there's a piece of fixed glass involved, it can be just about any size, okay?
Yes, sir. How difficult is it to put one of those where you have one of these? Um, if you can, if you're going to change out a window, it's it's not difficult at all. Basically, we make them the exact same size. Um, so basically, when changing out, you're going to have on a mahogany unit, you typically have your uh, one by four vertical uh, cedar siding um, that goes onto the window or trim by about nine sixteenths. So that needs to come off. Drywall goes into the what looks to be interior trim. That needs to be brought back or, or at least cut around. That goes out. New one goes in. You you know install it uh, plumb level square uh, insulation around the exterior and put the trim back on. Okay. Yeah. Very. I don't want to say easy, but it all depends on your skill level. Okay. But yes, we manufacture our sliding glass windows the same size as our casement windows with fixed glass. Okay? Generally, they'll be 90, 92 and a quarter wide, um, and the sliders will be, the, to replace an aluminum, will be 80 and a half tall. We have a retrofit slider and a new slider. A new slider is two and a half inches taller, or two inches taller. I don't know why. Um, the retrofit to made to fit the old aluminums is. 80 and a half tall by 92 and a quarter wide. On your old aluminum sliders, you're going to say, hey, Steve, the aluminum slider's smaller. It's, it is smaller, but there's one inch of pine on either side and the top, so it's deceiving. You're actually getting a bigger slider in that same opening. Okay. Um, best, best way to determine the width of a, of a slider, a window, up, a window that you're, you're looking to change out, is measure in between the beams. Um, on a typical deck house, it's a little different in this room, um, you're going to have beams that are eight feet on center. And they go directly over posts. So your posts are eight feet on center. In between, you have 92 and a half. We manufacture our sliders at 92 and a quarter. So you know if in between the sliders is bigger, I mean, in between the, the beams are bigger, you're all set. OK? That's the easiest way to tell the width. OK? All right. If, if, if we have first generation mahogany sliders, uh, what takes to, uh, is it possible to swap them for newer ones, or yes. does it make sense? Yep. Um, well, first I take a look and see what, what's going on with the slider. If, if, there's, if it was neglected and there's a lot of rot, yes, you definitely want to change it out, or at least remove it, check out the framework around it. If it's in good condition, clean it up, repair it, add weather strip, put it back. But if you want the newer slider or a window combination, yes, just put that right in place. So if you have the original uh, slider and it has adjustments on the ends of the operable door, um, those wheels are no longer available. At least I, I don't know where they are. Um, probably call a carpenter and a good carpenter, a skilled carpenter, maybe someone who knows deck house if there's one available. Have them take out the door and they may have even already done it. I know, I know quite a few carpenters that have, contractors that have taken out the old slider refit the new wheels and put it back in. On your slider, there's the, the track. that That's permanent. It goes underneath the other slider. There is a piece called the sill extension that is, has four screws on the top and a piece of weather strip that goes right up against the door. And the weather strip's missing from this one. But anyway, imagine a piece of weather strip right there. It goes right up against the door. Basically, that can be replaced, no problem. We have them in stock. They're a little taller than the old ones. Um, because if anything is, is kind of dropped down, we want the weather strip to touch the bottom of the door. So we made that, that piece a little taller than it was in the past. But basically, it's a. Uh, I get $20 part, something like that, maybe $25. Uh, four screws come out. It has weep holes in the bottom, so if water does get behind there, it can, it can drain out. Uh, and basically, it's another thing with the, with the operable door. What you want is to not be able to fit a piece of paper between your door and the frame. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to once in a while go out to your slider, test it with a, a piece of paper. If you can fit it in there, air and water can get through. You don't want that. So you can take out the, the sill extension, put a new one in, push it up against the door so it's snug, so that you can't fit a piece of paper there, and it's, it's a $20, $25 fix. So basically, it's when you step over this, the, uh, the track, it's the piece of wood on the outside mounted to the top of the sill. That's the sill extension. It's four screws, a probably like a one inch piece of wood by two inches wide and about 43 inches long. 
and that goes right on top of the sill, and it has a piece of weather strip that goes against the door. Um, there's also an adjustable um, metal piece with a weather strip on it that goes along the side on the exterior. It's a little rubber gasket. You can push that right up against the operable panel, and that's another thing you can uh, use to stop getting, allowing air into the, to the house at the slider, okay? Yeah, we have a ton of different uh, weather strips to help out if there is air getting around a window, slider, anything like that. All right, let me tell you what we, what we put on everybody's chair. Thank you. Um, we gave you all the weather strip that we have. We showed you handles, and it's not necessarily so you buy a handle, but those handles are gonna help you identify the slider that you have, the vintage and the style. If it's mahogany, we've used it for handles throughout history. So if you see your handle on there, you know the approximate year your slider was built, and that'll help me determine what we can help you with. Uh, there's also, there is an Arcadia slider handle there, and as you see there, unfortunately, we have no parts, sorry. Uh, then there's the two wheels. There's the New Englander slider wheel that we have, um, if you need, the, need that. Or there's the mahogany sliding glass door wheel with the face uh, adjustment only. Um, also, when you change out, if you have a 1981 to 1991 slider and you change out the wheel, your carp carpenter, or if you're skilled, uh, you're gonna have to drill a hole to allow that adjustment on the face as well. All right, so all kinds of different weather strip on here as well. And we have the document that shows you how to uh, determine what you have for an operator and how to, to swap them out, okay? And then also the other document just shows all the door styles, sizes, uh, it shows the steel casements, the, the replacement casement sizes, as well as new windows and sliders as well. All right, there you go, thank you very much. All right, um, any questions on sliding glass doors, aluminum or mahogany? All right, yes sir. I wanna kind of sneak in here a pocket door. Yes. Okay, so pocket door, you want to take off the jam uh, where the pocket door slides into. So on one side, you have a full jam, probably four nine sixteenths. On the other side, where the door slides into, you're going to have two rip pieces. That'll have to come off, and you'll have to disconnect the first wheel from the, from the slider, pull it all the way out, turn it, and then get the second one off. Is there an, is it, is it, what's happening with the slider, the, the pocket? Rough, a little bit bumpy. Okay. They're just wearing out. Yeah. Gotcha, yep, yeah. That's tough because that's now framed in there. If there are any screws coming through, if anyone's ever nailed anything through, um, that can be an issue. Um, hopefully it's just a changing out of the wheel. Um, otherwise it might have to be reframed with a new pocket door hardware kit. That's, that's a question in 17 and a half years I've, I have never gotten, so I'm not prepared. Might you have wheels or hardware that would be the same or similar to the old? Definite maybe. <laughs> um, so throughout history, we've been, we've been building deck houses from 1959 on. And in many different areas, we'd have a supplier stop selling a part or a mill closed down or a mill changing the product where it's not available anymore. Um, not to get off topic, but we have houses out there with four, four inch siding. In 17 and a half years, I've never sold it because it's not available anymore. Um, it's half inch thick, four inches wide, and the tongue and groove is, is tiny. So if the wood shrinks, they don't lock together as well as what we have today. So the answer to your question, do I have parts for a pocket door from 1979? Definite maybe. <laughs> um, um, it could be Johnson, it could be um, Stanley, there could be many, many different things. Um, maybe see if you can get an image of it and send it to me and I'll see what we have today and I can take a picture of that, send it to you, see if that works. Does that sound good? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the tough thing is that um, some businesses close and, uh, or they change product quite often actually, unfortunately. Um, so 
we have most of what we can uh, parts wise to help you out and almost most of the time a direct uh, change. Some I honestly don't know. That has never come up. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Maintenance question on a mahogany slide. The west facing gets hammered by the sun. So over the years, the joint, the rail of the style is opening up a little bit. Oh, okay. What allows wood to separate is is at some point it's been able to absorb moisture. Whether something has uh, shrinking and there's a gap and that water gets in there and then over years expand and contract, expand and contract, now you have a big gap. Um, I'd say the painter would probably be able to take a look at it and tell you better what it could be, but email me if you'd like. Email me a, a photo of what, what you're looking at, maybe far away and then close up and we'll see what, uh, what we can recommend. Um, is it possible that maybe they could glue and clamp it back together a little bit with some silicone or putty in there as well? Um, but the biggest thing is uh, setting up a maintenance schedule to make sure that um, what breaks down paints and stains is UV rays and water, whether it's dew, rain, humidity, that breaks down paints and stains. If it's a new product, I'd recommend taking a sample, like a cutoff, staining it exactly with what you're staining your slider, window, door, or whatever, siding with. And then a year later, keep that sample piece, put it in your basement. A year later, come out and compare that to what you, what you stained. And if the sheen is still the same on both, great, you're all set. Go back in a year later, that's dull. You probably need to, to restain or, or prep that material and stain that or seal that, that area. Okay. So again, what causes gaps, what causes cracking, what causes warping is water moisture getting into um, the wood. The wood's actually able to expand and contract and multiple times it's gonna cause it to warp, twist, bow, cup, crack, you name it, okay? All right. Okay, doors. All right, so early doors, um, again, we've been manufacturing our own doors since 1959. Your door sill, just like the rest of your, your items, is solid, inside to out. It's no two pieces, it's solid, right? Your, at some point, we actually had door jam that didn't have weather strip on it. Um, probably the earlier 60s, maybe 70s, I'd say probably 60s. And basically your door jam as a cross section looks like this here, okay? And we nailed on into a dado, so there is no straight line, into a dado, the stop bead for your door. And at some point, I don't know the date, we routed in a kerf cut for weather strip. If you don't have this kerf cut, you might want to either remove your stop bead and try to cut that in, or give me a call and we'll give you, sell you, um, stop bead with weather strip. It's going to seal around the door a lot better. Um, you're going to not feel a draft, and also um, a sweep at the bottom of the door. Even later on, it's, a, it's amazing, a lot of the doors may not have a sweep at the bottom. So if you can see daylight anywhere around your door, or door, window, or slider, Call me, let's fix that. Because that means air is getting in and water is getting in. So a sweep is a little rubber piece that gets mounted to the bottom of the door, all right? It has two little kerf cuts that go forced into the bottom of the door, stainless steel staples, and uh, it locks onto your, your uh, threshold. And that keeps air and water out from getting underneath your door. Well, Steve, my deck house has a huge a overhang. I don't have to worry about that. Well, there's wind-driven rain. And the last thing you want is a puddle on your nice finished floors, all right? So the biggest thing with doors is making sure that it is sealed. Um, then making sure the weather strip around the door is in great condition. Um, that's gonna stop air and water from getting into your house and hopefully reduce your, your uh, heating bills. Um, doors themselves are gonna be inch and three quarters. Uh, years ago, the door was either a flush mahogany door, which is a purchased door with a, a mahogany veneer, uh, or it was uh, a waffle door, um, the signature door from Deck House, which actually was made out of scrap pieces. Um, the, I think it was the president or one of the founders 
didn't like the fact they were throwing away so much mahogany. So he found a way to create a waffle block. It's a tiny waffle decorative piece that is now made up into, I think the waffle door is like 160 pieces in it. But that is all put together, um, takes gosh knows how many man hours, and uh, it's a beautiful looking door. But a lot of deck houses, that was the signature door for your house. Since then, we've made nine panel doors, eight panel doors, glass doors, prairie doors, and now this house has the, uh, it's what we call a four light door, which is the, the newest door. Um, does anybody have any issues with their, their swing doors in their house? <laughs> Excellent, okay. Um, sweats, so it's, it's condensating on the inside or the outside? Inside. Let's take a look at your weather strip around the door. All right, does you, let's check to see if your stop bead has that kerf cut and that, that is, that's in there. Uh, check underneath the door to see if it has a sweep that locks onto uh, threshold and uh, we can go from there. And I know that when I noticed a lot of the, a thin line of daylight both okay. in the middle where they meet and the bottom. Okay, so one thing that your door may not have is a teastrical weather strip. A teastrical is a piece that looks like this. We take one of our double doors and we cut it down a half inch smaller than, than we normally would. And we would mount this astrical that creates a stop for the, the swinging door. And that has a kerf cut in it with a piece of weather strip. Like years ago in the 60s, some of the houses may not have the kerf cut for the weather strip around the perimeter. Yours may not have a weather strip in the theatrical itself. The biggest thing is you want to make sure that um, one door should close over the other, and that's what the theatrical is is there for. Um, I guess maybe even earlier there might not have been an astrical, but an actual just stop nailed to the face of the door. You want to make sure there's a good weather strip between the two. And the older the door, the more of a chance at one point it, it was absorbing moisture, and one could warp or both. Um, you can adjust hinges and pull the door back, but then if you change out doors, now you have a hinge that might be in the wrong spot for a true, true door. So that's, that's kind of tricky. Still solid, solid flush door. The solid flush door is a purchase door, and I'd rather not. Um, we got a door for a customer probably about four years ago, and it's a purchase door. We have no control over how it looks when it comes in. It was called a plank door. It's a veneer, very thin veneer. Um, one side looked like it had a racing stripe. It was light, light, dark in the middle. The opposite side of the door was light, dark, light. So the customer says, I'm not getting that door. I said, well, I, okay. Um, but I would rather not. It's, it's at least a two to $3,000 door when we're getting a veneer. I would rather take a look at our doors instead or go elsewhere, because I do not like the, the veneer door. All right? The veneer door also, um, it has such a thin veneer on it, you can take hand sandpaper, and eventually you'll go through the veneer. So now you're stuck with a $2,000 door that's, you know, has a veneer on it. Our doors are solid mahogany. You can't sand through them. So, all right? Yes? I'm surprised at how much, how little uh, the waffle door was compared to the other, you know, based on the quality of 160 pieces, yeah. all of this, yeah. like not much of a percentage more. It was a great deal. Yeah. So. It, it's amazing. People think that the mahogany sliders or mahogany uh, doors are a little pricey. But you go anywhere else, and they're not solid. It's a veneer, or they cost three, four times as much. So yes, sir? Just say, I just purchased a bunch of sliders, and they've not been installed. But I did try and carry them into the garage, <laughs> and they are 350 pounds of serious, serious yeah. Ooh, yeah. Thank you. Um, one thing that I uh, forgot to mention is that what we do for our styles, a style is a vertical member of a, of a door. And on our swing doors and our sliders, we actually laminate three pieces of mahogany together um, and glue them together to reduce warping, twisting, bowing, cupping. Um, basically, the longer and larger a piece of wood is, the more of a chance it can warp, twist, bow, or cup. But when you have grains fighting each other, instead of going all the same direction, it's going to be less likely for that to, to warp. So we, we actually went out and had, we started this in 1999. Uh, we got a laminating machine and a press, and we independently tested uh, glue. And the glue we use today is Tight Bond 2 wood glue. 
people say, oh, you gotta use Gorilla. Well, Type on 2 wood glue, we actually sent out to an independent company, and they took our, our laminated mahogany. They boiled it for, for 20 hours. They put it in an oven for 250 degrees for four hours. They did that cycle all over again for a second time, and there was zero delamination between the wood and the glue. And that was 1999, we're still using it today. So that glue and the lamination we use on our doors and sliders um, to virtually eliminate issues and to give you a better quality product. Yes, sir? We have a single waffle door, and I noticed that uh, there's a carpet in front So I would say most likely someone put a sweep on the bottom of the door that an aftermarket sweep. So probably take off the door, remove that sweep, and put on a, a new sweep. This one doesn't have any metal. Yes? To the original, uh, what year did you start the manufacturing of the waffle door? I'd say at least the late 60s, early 70s maybe. Yeah. That is a great question. Did they, sorry. Yep. I mean, something. No, that's all right. No, but I just wonder, is the, did the original design have a door sweep or most? Because I just That's a good question. I don't know from 59 to when we actually started putting sweeps on the bottom of the doors. It, yeah, it might be late 60s, early 70s that we, we actually started, but there are some without. Well, we so. About door sweeps. No, whether they came with them or not from the original. I, that I don't know. Door. Yes. I recall coming with our waffle door, recall coming home, painters from work, they just found, and they're picking up ball bearings all over. Oh. Okay. So the hinges are a ball bearing uh, hinge. Uh, what you want to do is unscrew it from the jam and or the door. You don't want to try taking it apart because it is a system of ball bearings uh, so that you don't have all that um, metal to metal uh, grit, uh, you know, like filings uh, on the door. So it's a very, very good, it's a four by four exterior ball bearing hinge. You want to make sure that they just unscrew it, not try taking it apart. Yes? Uh, do you have any panel doors? Yes. So they come single and double? Uh, the panel doors, so that, what you're looking at there is a, a nine panel door. Yes, every door you see can be a single door or a double door. Um, the nine panel door, there's actually a, a single panel that's taller and two smaller panels next to it, and then they flip flop or mirror image. Um, double doors, you'd probably want to have one door mirror image of the other um, so it looks nice together, yes. But any door can be a single or uh, a double door, yes. Do you have any doors that don't have these panels that are just, just simple? Yep, so that was the flush door that I'd rather not sell because the veneer is so thin and it's really expensive. So to get a quality door, um, I would probably go with maybe uh, either a panel door or a glass door. And a glass door you can get with, with uh, obscure glass on it. So if you're afraid of, you don't want to get a glass door, you don't want people looking in, you can get, uh, like the door right there, has, is a, that's an opal laminated glass. And that has a veneer of uh, like a, a whitish um, poly between two pieces of glass so you can't see in well. Oh. Um, but there's many different types of obscurity that you can get for, for glass like that. That's, what, that's why we'd rather not do the, the flush door because it is a veneer. And over the years, like 20, 30, 40 years ago, the veneer might have been an eighth of an inch. Now we're lucky if it's a 32nd. So if you take even hand sandpaper, not a machine, and do this, you might go right through the veneer in a couple different uh, sandings. But size-wise, the, the nine panel would match. Uh, yep, yes. The, the sizes, for the most part, that you have on your homes on the exterior is a 3068 or a 3070. And that's that's we do all day, every day. We can do some customs. Um, but yeah, if it's not that, we can we can talk about it. There's also a form I can email you to if you want to replace a door. It'll tell you, you know, things to measure, what to look out for, so we can get that exact door size mm -hmm. to, to put into place. Sure. <coughs> yep. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Yes. If we were going to replace an eight-foot slider, yep. outside slider, um, with a window, yep. could we use 
that shape um, that's in your vestibule? Or Absolutely. Do you need to have a cross piece for an eight foot? You can do one huge piece of glass. Mm -hmm. It's just going to cost a little bit more per square foot. Because any glass over 32 square foot, we go with a thicker glass for, you know, to be a little stronger. And then if it's 52 square feet or close to that, we're even going to go thicker. And, the re and we also want to have a good space between. Um, Code-wise, it has to be tempered because of the square footage. But as big as it is, you want to go with a thicker glass. But yes, we can do, as long as they can make a piece of glass for it, we can make a window for it. Absolutely. Yes. Anyone? Question? Yes, sir. With the birds will the deck. Yes. It checks eventually. Anything you can do to minimize that and fill the checks? Uh, so the inside of your house, you're saying the inside or your exterior? Uh, exterior? Oh, all right. So balcony decking. I'm just going to jump back, and then I'll answer your question. So balcony decking, your deck houses, some of them have a deck in the back with a shape of decking like this. Anyone sees that that doesn't know a deck house thinks you're nuts. They're used to seeing real thin decking with, with joists that are 16 inches apart. Our joists are just like running from your inside out and are eight feet apart. So we have to get a, a thicker decking board with eight inch nails that tie one piece of the decking to the next to strengthen that decking. OK? Checking or cracking is when the outer piece of the wood expands and contracts and dries out at a different rate than the center. So if the top is, is uh, if the whole thing gets wet and the sun is hitting the top, it's going to crack. So our supplier says to the mill, actually says just to seal it. If you put something in there, and it starts to swell up again, it's going to force that crack to get deeper and longer. So you don't want to fill it. You just want to seal it, OK? Let the sun evaporate in there. If it's real deep, do you replace that wood or, or what? But checks are going to happen. It's, it's natural. It's such a big piece of wood, it will check, OK? Uh, earlier reminded me, so your sliders, like I said, are uh, 92 and a quarter wide for the most part. Um, some of your entryways, you'll have an eight foot six wide bay. Um, people wanted a wider set of stairs, so they opted to get, instead of their beams and posts eight feet on center, at your entry when you walk in, it's actually eight foot six. That carries through to the back of the house. So you might need a slider or a window that's eight foot six instead of eight foot. Okay? That's just something to, to think about. Okay? Um, I think what else? Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. So it's uh, today what we use for your floor decking on a balcony deck is Western Red Cedar. We used Port Orford Cedar years ago, and we used pressure treated. The last thing you want to put on your deck is pressure treated, especially with the three by six. So. We were throwing away probably 30 to 40% of our pressure treated decking boards because pressure treated is soaked in chemicals so it doesn't rot. That's what it's treated. Okay, that's why it's treated. Um, once that starts drying on the exterior, the interior is not. So it's warping, twisting, bowing, cupping, even after it's nailed on and checking like you wouldn't believe, cracking. So we were throwing away so much wood, we said, all right, we're changing the product and we changed to Port Orford Cedar. That was a very good product, became more and more scarce. So they went to Re Western Red Cedar probably about 20 years ago. We've been using that for 20 years. We're probably getting 700 pieces in in a couple weeks, so that'll be good. It's a long lead time for your deck. If anyone, anyone needs to replace their deck, I hope not. I hope we're all good. If you do, you do want to probably place the order in the spring, uh, early spring, as early as possible. Every year we get five to seven hundred pieces of decking in, and every year it sells out right before the truck arrives or right after the truck arrives. And it's a three to four month lead time to get those 18 and 20 footers in. So it might be a large gap in the middle of your summer when you're looking to do your deck that we may not have the parts because of the lead time. It's tough to get trees that are old growth that are that long, even new growth that are that long because it's 18 and 20 footers. It's a solid piece of wood. Uh, lumberjacks have to go to a certain area. Then it's in the kiln for 
about four to five weeks to get it down to a certain moisture content that's, that, that we will allow. If you get air dried material or pressure treated, it'll more likely to warp, twist, bow, cup, and crack. Okay? That's, it's, the lead time is, is, is definitely worth it to have, to have uh, kiln dried material. That is a mahogany piece. So basically, it's an uh, inch and a quarter by two, or it can be larger if you'd like, because I don't know if you can fit a beer or wine glass on that. So if you want something wider, we can, we can do that as well. But yes, that's, that's fairly new. For the most part, you guys probably have um, deck railings that are uprights that have slight angles to them that are mounted to either side of a, of, of a beam. And then you have about you know eight foot section of mahogany rail with balusters. And even way back when, some don't even have balusters. They just have horizontal pieces that don't meet code today. What's that? This kind of design. Yes, so basically on interior and exterior stairs, interior and exterior railings, you cannot, you should have it so you cannot fit a four inch cylinder or ball anywhere through any of the stairs or railings. Um, if you can, it doesn't meet code. Um, a lot of you may have open rise stairs where you can see right through the, the treads. Those probably don't meet today's code, but I'm sure they grandfathered in. Today, we have to put in either a stainless steel cable rail, so it separates the, the, rise, the two treads, um, a piece of glass we've done, um, or a piece of mahogany to reduce it so, you can, so it meets code. But uh, we still do open, I'd call it semi-open rise stairs today because they can't be completely open rise and meet code today. Okay? One more question. Yes. On the, on the doors, so yes. those flash... Uh, the flush doors? Yeah, the flash y doors. Yep. Yeah. Uh, all the weather sweeping and all our stuff uh, and the sweeps, we still can get those from you. Right Absolutely, now. yep, yeah. Sure. Yeah, basically if you look at your deck house and something in there is made of wood, we can help you out. All right, yes. What do you use to seal the deck, each, the outside deck? Each that would be, I would talk to a paint professional. There are so many products out there. There are people that love Sickens. There are people that love Penafin. There are people that love Olympic. And we could probably ask every other person here, and they'll give you a different answer. Um, um, well, you want to make sure that it's, it's a good product for Western Red Cedar, if that's what you have. Um, and it basically, it depends on the product. It depends on, on the species of wood you have, how old it is. And also, it doesn't matter what, I don't want to say it doesn't matter what you use, but it's not only as important the product you use, but the prep for the material. You could use the best paint and stain in the world, but if your material isn't prepared to receive that, it'll fail. It, as per whatever product it is. Some want you to sand it right down to uh, raw wood so the cells can absorb the, the stain itself. Some want like an acid type stain, uh, uh, acid wash uh, so that it opens up the pores or the, or the cells of the wood. Um, basically, you want to use the product, uh, manuf uh, the product manufacturer's instructions to the letter of what you're, you're using, okay? Yeah, basically, if you want to send me an email, I can, I can email you. It's like 13 pages of information on identifying different stains and their qualities and what they'll do. Um, it's tough for us to recommend one thing or another because everyone has different preferences of what they like. Uh, Penafin will actually penetrate the cells of the wood. It's not like a coating. It actually gets into the cells of the wood. It's not a layer. Um, but we've had a lot of people love uh, uh, Penafin. So decks. We'll talk about decks a little bit. Um, um, Restaining your deck, it all depends on the foot traffic. If you don't use the deck much, it may not need to be sealed as much. Um, if it sees a ton of sun, sun's going to break down the stain. Um, if it doesn't see enough sun, if there's a lot of overgrowth around it, that means that the sun isn't evaporating moisture on the deck, and that's going to break down the stain. So how often? depends on not only what it says on the can, but if you're on your deck with a party every weekend, that's going to wear down the finish, and you're going to need to finish it more often than, than you think. Um, same thing with the sides of your house. Um, you, if, you have, if, your sun is, if the sun is pounding on one side of the house, you may need to finish that more often than the other three sides. Um, if there's a lot of overgrowth too close to the house on one side, again, moisture isn't evaporating, and, and dew is going to sit on that house longer and break down the, the paints and stains. 
Okay. Yes, sir. Any tips on cleaning mildew from under the eaves? There's a Sickens uh, video. I don't know. Did, we, did you see the Sickens video? All right. So um, we have about 15 videos on our YouTube page. Uh, we did four seminars. We did one on glass. And if you're interested in glass, I'd recommend checking it out. All our seminars are about two hours long. Uh, myself and an expert spoke to about 50 or 60 deck house owners, answered questions, and then it was added down to about 20 minutes. So you could actually sit there and watch it. Um, there's one on glass, one on exterior stain, one on skylights, and one on updates. So when you get a chance, I do recommend uh, checking those out. Um, washing mildew off. Um, I believe uh, Bryant Mahoney is a representative for Sickens. Sickens is owned by PPG Coatings, who owns about 12 different coatings companies. Um, I can email you his information, and he can directly tell you not only what to use, but probably how to prep it, because he's seen it. OK? Excellent. Yes? Carpenter uh, <laughs> Yes. I know there's a million traps you can play around with. Yep. Uh, but the, is the key basically to make sure that the the no, I don't think that's that's the total. The um, so I I've heard that carpenter bees are territorial, so basically they're always going to come back. Um, getting rid of that's a good one. Um, so you can call pest control, uh, like uh, something like that, to use powders and things like that. You can stuff holes with uh, like a um, like a copper mesh and putty it. Um, if you're ever doing any remodeling and you are removing pieces, maybe put on like a, a hardy board so it's cement, so they're not going to chew through it. But as far as bees and carpenter ants goes, that's, that's sometimes tough. So when you the overhang the, the roof deck, and that's it right there, the three by six? Yes, um, yep. When you do redo your roof, can you pull off that flashing? That would be a time to repair those boards. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yep. And if you're redoing your roof, if you're adding insulation, then you weigh out, do you add a second shadow board, or do you add um, hardy board? And that way the bees, if it's, if it's a problem that's constantly happening, happening then you might want to replace that. Gotcha. gotcha. It's pretty new. Okay. And I know carpenter ants, a lot of times they have scouts that scurry around, and they will find uh, water leaks in your roof, or they won't find the leaks, but they'll find the wet wood and wet insulation. If wood's wet or insulation's wet, it's going to be easier for them to chew through them. So that's what they look for. Um, yeah, you will find, at least with carpenter ants, I don't know about carpenter bees, but if you ever had a roof leak and you have wet wood or wet insulation up there, uh, ants find it. I mean, it's your roof. They live on the ground. But I was told they actually will climb trees and drop onto houses. I don't know. but. Um, they will find the, the wet wood and wet insulation easier to chew through, and they will conalize. Con, conalize? Con, thank you. Uh, call, yeah, that too. Um, and basically, you have to get the queen. Otherwise, they will keep reproducing and destroy your, your roof system, unfortunately. See the decking uh, on, the, uh, on, on the ceiling. I'm seeing the boards kind of disconnecting, Ooh. sort of, or you know, just not. So they are not flash, right? In a couple of places, you can see that they're misaligned, if you will. Hmm. So that, what that would be. I would assume it's at one point you had a moisture issue in the house. Um, because the boards are nailed straight down to the, um, the beams themselves and toenailed into each other. So if you have decking that's offset or moved, I'd say, I mean, it could be that it, you know, they expand and contract. The sun's hitting your roof. It's heating up that area. There's heat on the inside. It can shrink and lose moisture. It can expand and contract. That sounds to me like it's doing a little bit more um, that it might be in a leak at some point. Yes, Mike. Uh, we're about to replace our roof after 32 years. OK. And uh, should we, so we have the, just a two inch rigid foam. Yep. Should we put more something else? Absolutely, yes. So two inch rigid foam, you have an R value of about 12, if that. Um, you, depends on local code. Um, what year was your house built? 85. Good, OK. 85, your house was built. It had your 3 by 6 decking. Uh, it has 15 pound felt. It has uh, insulation, the polyisosanurate foil face, both side insulation. Um, then plywood, 
than your shingles. Houses prior to 1981 didn't have plywood, believe it or not. They nailed through the shingle, through the insulation, into the roof decking. So that I don't agree with, but I was in elementary school or something. Anyway, um, with, with that, an R value of 12 isn't a lot. Um, you really, it's, it's a catch if you go to the town and say, you know, what should the R value of my roof be? Um, because unlike a, a regular stick built house, you don't have an attic. You can't just add insulation inside, it has to be on top of your roof. Um, maybe ask your town, see what it needs to be, but you're probably gonna need to add more insulation, then more plywood, then shingles, and that's not gonna be cheap. Yes? Uh, we had a house that's just old enough that didn't have the plywood above the two-inch foam. Yep. It means that when you take it apart, you don't have two-inch foam. It's completely degraded, oh. and it goes all over the yard. We went to four inches, and of course, that meant building a building spaceship. Correct. What I can say now with four inches of the foam is that the snow stays on that roof as long as it stays on the uninsulated garage. Gotcha, yep. So the heat was just getting right through to your roof. <laughs> yep, yes. Okay, with four inches of insulation, you found that the, the snow stays there, doesn't melt, so you're not losing heat through your roof. Okay, yes? With the extra insulation, is, is, are the panels channeled so that you allow for some air movement? No, no. no. Uh, so in 19, we started in 59, all the way up to today, the only time we vented our deck house roof system was in the mid 90s. That's also when we had huge condensation issues. So it's been said that the, the roof is such a low pitch that it didn't cool the air that was, that was going through the, the vented system and it actually condensated. So today, this roof system isn't vented and we don't have any issues. So it's, I would, rec I will email me and I'll send you um, a whole sheet on, on deck house roofs and, and what you want to look for with a, car, with a contractor. Yes, sir. Has anybody tried uh, heating strips and so on on the eaves to keep the ice down? I do not know. Um, but one thing about heating strips or raking your roof, wherever you rake them to, that's where an ice dam might, might start back up. Right. So you're darned if you do, you're, you're darned if you don't. Shoveling is a great exercise. <laughs> Ooh, you definitely want to shovel down the roof, though. Yes, exactly. yeah. And always be cautious. You don't want it's. You don't want to fall off the roof. It's not the fall. It's that sudden stop at the end that'll that'll get you. You gotta put one in. Let's say you're only putting one in in the center. Yep. What's the story? You're not going from the outside in. Okay. So the question is on three by six balcony decking. You have many rows that are nailed together horizontally with an eight inch gutter spike that's um, holding them all together one to the next. To get them apart, saws all. To replace a piece in the middle. Difficult. Um, you want to have them connected, but when replacing one in the middle, you can't drive an eight inch nail through. I know people have put like a uh, two by four uh, underneath, tying them together, but you want to be cautious there because that can cause uh, rot. You know, the, the water can collect on, on that board. Um, there isn't an easy answer for that one, replacing one piece in the middle of the, of the deck. Um, that also, I've, ha I've heard of people putting a deck over a deck. You never want to do that. Um, basically, you're allowing water to get in, in between a seam and you'll expedite rot. You want to take off the decking, put new decking down. You never want to put a surface over it. As well as, I recently heard of a customer putting a, you know, the fake grass. They put that on top, and basically that just held water and expedi expedited the rot as well. Um, same thing if you have a, if you have a joist uh, running through your house out, eight feet on center, your, your deck, different than this one, but, um, and you have some, some rot happening because either the previous owner didn't take care of it or whatever. You do not want to sister uh, steel or uh, another joist to that. Again, you'll allow water to get in between there and it'll expedite the rot and it'll rot faster, okay? Covered porch then partially is the roof of the garage and then an overhang. And it had, when we bought the house, it had all season carpet, which is pretty old, so we pulled it up and there seems to be this rubber barrier. What, what do you recommend if we don't want carpet to? Huh, okay. Yep. 
So what you have is a roof deck. Yeah. Um, a surface you can walk on that is actually still a roof. That's tough. Generally, the membranes, whatever you put on there, they last about 15 years. They expand and contract, you walk on them, they crack, and you, you generally have a leak. Um, that is not an area that I'm going to be able to help you out with, so I definitely recommend you talk to a contractor. Um, you can put a deck over it, and people have put like uh, silicone, um, almost like little legs for your decking uh, uh, joist to sit on uh, so it doesn't you know, um, directly come in contact with the membrane. Um, but I would definitely talk to a contractor and see what the best thing to put down there that's going to work best for you. Sorry, I didn't have an answer for that one. To these beams here, where they come into the wall. Yep. Um, some of mine, of course, you can see light through both sides, and we're talking about insects and stuff before. But what is the solution for that? Can you fill it with a great stuff or silicone or caulking or something like that, or is it designed to be? Yeah, no, nope, it's it's not designed that way. If you have settling and there's movement or the beam twists, you definitely want to uh, silicone it or, or use like a cedar colored caulking, paintable or stainable caulking from the exterior. Um, if you can get any sort of expanding foam insulation or something in there, I'd uh, do that uh, as long as you can protect it from uh, weather from the exterior, and then uh, probably putty or, or caulk it from the interior as well. All right. Where are the stink bugs? Oh, goodness. Well, that, I would say you definitely, that's the weather strip thing. You definitely want to make sure your, your weather strip is solid, not missing. Uh, they will find a way in. Um, the old tan V-shaped piece of plastic, they could probably just walk by. Um, and if it's cracked or missing, that's just an invitation to come right in. Um, I can't say that the, the foam-filled weather, uh, weather strip is going to stop them, but I'd have to assume it's going to do, do a lot better than what you have there. I don't know how they, how they can compress their body to what size, but yes, I, I'm in a deck house office, and I, yeah, we, I'll look up, and there's like three crawling around the ceiling once in a while. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, so also, where a gable end is on your house, and the tongue and groove decking create a V groove. Um, if the original builder did not put a three inch, uh, foam, a three inch by three eighths foam strip um, that compresses and expands where there are little voids, like the, where the V grooves are, uh, then yeah, insects can crawl in and out of there all day, every day. Um, I would go along the exterior house, um, cedar colored caulking or something like that. Um, very fine tip, just. Uh, caulk where your roof decking meets your, meets your wall, and every time the V-groove happens, let that, the tip of the caulking gun go up in there, let it go for a second, and then continue on. That way it'll fill all voids and less chances and less areas for them to come in and out of. Uh, check the weather strip on doors and sliders. I honestly don't know if there's any weather strip on the old aluminum sliders. I don't know how much weather strip is, is even there. If they like deck houses or what? Oh, and no, it doesn't matter. Any house. Any house. Yep. Yes. If, a lot of times, like, I went to a friend's house, and uh, the family was running around frantically grabbing vacuums and brooms and all that stuff. And I'm like, what the heck are these people doing? I walked to the back room, and there are literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of ladybugs climbing or crawling all over the place on, the, on one of their sliders trying to get in. It wasn't a deck house. It was just... Uh, the house was recently built, so I'm wondering if it was an area that they kept coming back to or something like that, but and that might be the same thing with a uh, pumpkin bug, stink bug. I don't know if they're the same thing, but they're very similar. All right. Because of windows, and the fourth is open to the living room. So placing cabinets where the um, baseboard base heaters are is a, is a challenge, how to heat the space, which is pretty big. So when the original, um, all right, so you have issues with heating around uh, remo remodeling a kitchen yes. and trying to do it and keep the, the sense of the deck house. Um, so in our 1985 model that our office is at, um, our kitchen has a large window right above cabinets, and we have um, uh, heat right there, and basically uh, there's mahogany covering it, and I believe there's a metal uh, strip that reflects the heat 
uh, into the room. Um, I am not a heating guy. So um, I'm not going to be able to help you out with that much, but I'm sure Jason will. I, I'm living this experience right now, and I've talked to a lot of people about it. Um, so do you have baseboard like kind of up the wall and like a weird zigzag behind the cabinet, and there's like an air gap? Like so, so now, right now, we don't have any base. There's no cabinets along the wall of the house at all. Right. It's all baseboard in two areas because it's such a big kitchen. They call it a heat bench. It's a double baseboard. Okay. Hmm. We would like to install cabinets where there's just a baseboard now. So what I did was I took, I'm, I'm in the process now, we took the baseboard pipe and we could, we left that there. We basically built out maybe by about four inches. We put the cabinets up against there and we actually let those baseboards, the baseboard pipe come behind the cabinets still so that you get the heat from the water baseboard pipe. And we put, uh, we had, cut out in the baseboard of the cabinet so that you can get airflow from the top and the bottom. And I can show you like, I'm driving probably broad, but you'll get airflow in. Because someone we know took the, that system out, they put cabinets in, and when the real cold hit, the inside of the cabinets were so cold that the pipes were freezing, they had to open all the cabinets. So, and they took that out, and it was a, it was a really big mistake. So we ended up keeping that existing detail and we lost the four inches in the kitchen, but we will hopefully do it in the warm room next winter, probably. Yeah, we were told, oh yeah, it's easy, just put in the toe kick warmer. Yeah, mm -hmm. the problem is they have fans, and they make noise. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I said the best bet there is to talk to a contractor who knows deck houses, because these are guys that have been building and remodeling deck houses for up to like 50 years. So, and they've probably done multiple, multiple kitchens, and all, I don't want to say all deck houses, but most deck houses are built very, very similar. They have the three by six decking, you have your, your beams eight feet on center, you have your windows right there, and the heating systems in the 60s, all about the same, 70s is about the same, um, and these guys have remodeled those. So I would lean towards that, someone who knows deck house, because you could spend thousands trying to do one thing that they've, they've already done, and they might be able to help you out a lot, a lot easier. Okay? Yeah. Uh, we just did an addition of a studio which has bookshelves full of fabric along all the walls. No place for baseboard. We put in radiant heat. Yep. Best thing we possibly could have done. Okay. Or high yeah. yeah. How much? The floor. Like, it was new construction. Uh, so we were able to do the plywood on top with the grooves and then put the floating part of the floor over that. Uh, doing it from the bottom is possible, but harder and less efficient. The other thing, Steve, you and I talked about, we have sliders. There was presumably a mahogany heat stool down there, yep. which is a mahogany cased thin tube radiator. That had at some point been removed. I was going to replace the mahogany heat stool, thin tubing. The rest of that floor has cast iron baseboard. So the fin tube would have had a different thermal inertia from the cast iron it wouldn't have worked really well. What we ended up doing was to put in a ruffle baseboard there. Uh, it was a perfect fit under the slider. It thermally, it plays well with the cast iron baseboard, and it's rugged enough that if you bump it with your foot going in and out of the sliders, it stands up to it very well. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any questions on anything that I haven't discussed? All right. If you think of something today, tomorrow, five years from now, send me an email, give me a call. I'll try to help you out as much as I can. Okay? Thank you for coming.